besides Benioff, had the conviction that SAS was going to kind of submit on-premise or hybrid software yeah. and click the, I mean, and CyberU rebrand itself as Cornerstone. Yeah. And all this time, going back to that pivotal moment at the RFP, I stayed in co contact with people like that. So after the Saba exit, and we we had a conversation, mm -hmm. and Adam goes, look, I think SAS will become a pivotal transformation moment just like the internet was, mm -hmm. and people will adopt cloud technologies at scale, even governmental organizations. That's oh, I don't know. I'm sure you and Mark are convicted about that, <laughs> but me being a government guy, it's going to be a, a lagger indicator. So he calls me in like 2015, he was like, hey, Jim, we just closed our first software as a service deal at U.S. Department of Treasury. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's a signal. That's <laughs> to your and, point. Yes, you start to watch what's happening, you right? You start to watch what's happening. You see transformation in the industries. Welcome to the HR Huddle Podcast, presented by Sapient Insights Group, the ultimate resource for all things HR. It's time to get in the huddle. Welcome everyone, I'm Stacey Harris. I am joining you here at the HR Technology Conference for our special session on spilling the tea on HR Tech. And joining me today is Jim Gill, and he is the CEO of Zero to In. And we're gonna have a little powwow on spilling the till about spilling the tea about all the things that you guys are doing that are exciting and new right now. But also you and I have known each other a long time. So we're gonna talk a little bit yeah. about Jim, his background and, and what he's bringing to this new role that he's in. So Jim, can you basically first give um, the audience a little bit of a, uh, insight into sort of how you got into the role of CEO of Zero In and, and what your background was to sort of get there. Well, first of all, hi to everyone. <laughs> Second, it is great to be here with somebody I've known a long yeah. time who's kind of a major influence in this industry. Um, second, you know, usually it's virtual. This is yes. the first time we've seen each other in a couple, three years. So mm -hmm. this is awesome to be here in person with you, but broader the industry, kind of mm -hmm. look around and see the transformation that's going on. Yeah. So my history, kind of short story, tell of two careers. I spent 21 years in the Army. Um, huge. Gave me a unique opportunity to travel the world, see different cultures, assimilate, kind of learn at the tactical operational level and even the strategic level, kind of how the Army operates as an enterprise. Yeah. Served the first tour in Central South America, did some advisory work, yeah. uh, Jungle Operations Special Warfare Center, spent three years in the 101st Airborne Division, wow. went to Germany, for all you younger viewers and <laughs> listeners, there used to be a, like an iron curtain yeah. across the divided Germany to east and west Germany. Yeah. So I went to the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment and I had a unique job, Stacy, where I was the kind of border operations, non-commissioned officer, so we collected wow. intel, uh, human intel, spatial intel, signet intel of the Russians' 8th Guards Army, who was the opposing force. All right, guys, you are getting the detail because I didn't even know all of this. <laughs> but it's so, uh, it's a great, I mean, that's an amazing background and, and all the things that you've done, yeah, right? Look, it, it was, it, look, from a small town in southern Georgia, to kind yeah. of see that, the aperture, and I've always been a lifelong learner, right? So that was kind of a unique learning lab, yeah. not only just kind of seeing the world and diversity and diversity of thought and populations, but also kind of leadership, right? Yeah. How small level leadership, unit leadership scales to kind of massive leadership. And that experience, particularly in East West German yeah. border, I had the unique point in time to be someplace in history that a lot of people, you know, missed out on. Yeah. So when the wall came down and the Iron Curtain came down in 1980, Nine, I was on the east-west German border, and I worked for a guy uh, who was the regimental commander at that time, and we took a helicopter, and we saw this massive flow of humanity cross from wow. west to east, from east Germany to west Germany. We landed the helicopter, Stacey. You were seeing history in the oh, making there. It yeah, right in front of me right. unfold. Now I'm geeking out on history, guys. Massive, <laughs> massive amount of humanity yeah. freeing to freedom. Freedom. So we landed a helicopter in this town called Rasdorf, which is separated by Iron Curtain for over 40 years. Yeah. We landed, you know, the regiment commander was talking to press and, you know, the liaisons between the Russian army and East German border guards and kind of U.S. intelligence agency. And I ran across this woman who was in tears and she was talking to this other lady 
and you know, in my fractured German, I ask her kind of, what is this? She goes, that's my sister. Oh. And I haven't seen her in 38 years. Wow, what a point in time, right? It was a point in time that showed me the importance of values yeah. and what we brought as a nation to kind of, yeah. kind of give what right looks like and freedom. And I was there, unfortunate to see that happen. I left yeah. from there, kind of right in the hot water, you know, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. I deployed back to Fort Stewart, Georgia, 24th Infantry Division, and we were the first boots on the ground along with Special Forces Battalion inside Kuwait, uh, inside Saudi Arabia when Saddam uh, invaded Kuwait. Wow, and, yeah. And President Bush said, you know, this will not stand. I won't now, tell you what grade I was in high school at that point. <laughs> yes, everyone knows. See, we're friends. She yes. can say that to me. I mean, oh, she called me old yeah. on camera. <laughs> Um, but, you know, that was another unique experience where I saw the operational component. How, how do we go to war? Yeah. How do we fit American values and what we stand for? And I spent a year there yeah. and came back, spent another year in Iraq. And the last job in the Army, we get to the HR practices. I had the unique fortune to kind of go in a detailed assignment to the Army Recruiting Command. Yeah. So each military service has its talent acquisition arm. Mm -hmm. In the Army, it's the Army Recruiting Command, the Navy, some, you know, Navy Recruiting Command, and the Marine Corps. And at that time, this was um, mid-90s, late-90s, early 2000s, uh, we were recruiting about eight, 80,000 people a year wow. to man the all-volunteer force. Yeah. So you had to go through a school, and the school was like 12 weeks. Weeks They teach you, you know, the value of joining the Army, kind of the emotional benefits, what you give young people and their parents. Yeah. How do you map that to the Army national advertising campaign? Yeah. And that gave me kind of a, I tell everybody, a mini MBA course of, Sales, yeah. marketing, tied to value, emotional intelligence. Yeah. So I did that, you know, did very well as a regional kind of commander, ran a city, went to Miami, South Dade, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, ran that whole region. Yeah. And then I got the unique opportunity to be a practitioner in HR. So I got selected to be the, the director of training and development for the Army Recruiting School. The and same school I went through. The uh, same school we went to, and one of the biggest training programs oh, in the world, right? Huge, like just massive, right? Huge. Yeah. We put eight to ten thousand students a year yeah. through either the basic Army recruiting course to keep teach all those yeah. disciplines I talked about, or the officer, non commissioned officer yeah. development leadership course to how to run cities, how to run a nation recruiting campaign, a lot of that stuff. And we taught them technology of, you know, how to demo the product. Yeah. It was my first entree <laughs> into kind of solution consulting demo. Yeah. You demoed the value of the Army, you know, over a laptop, yeah. right? So massive learning curve. And through this exercise, you know, we were spending on the millions of dollars of housing, you know, food, you know, secondary tuition reimbursement, travel, and we, were, travel yeah. <laughs> and we were taking all of these soldiers away from their families for a yeah. massive amount of time, which is the bigger impact. Yeah. So I had a boss at that time, very innovative two-star general who later became the desk her personnel chief of the army. He's like, hey, Jim, actually he said top, yeah. which is my <laughs> master sergeant. He's like, I hear, this was like 2000, Stacey, and I met you shortly after that. Yeah. He said, I hear you could take this thing called training over something called the internet. <laughs> Back in the day. Back, Back in the day. day, it was called e-learning, guys. Just it was called e-learning. Yeah. It was called e-learning. <laughs> but for a brick-and-mortar organization that was kind of us utilizing Cratic yeah. instructor on the stage, cohorts. That was all there was back then, yeah. That's all there were. It was no blended learning. It was no yeah. horses over the internet. Later came big yeah. DVDs and CD-ROMs, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. He said, go explore this. I said, okay. He said, I'll run my RFP. How much money do you need? So I told him. <laughs> and he goes, the ROI would be, how do we reduce training costs? How do we reduce all these lodging yeah. costs? How do we maintain the fidelity of the curriculum and the intrinsic value we're giving? And how we give soldiers more time with their family yeah. preschool and post-school. Yeah, which is important. I have a son who's in the Air Force. Yeah. And thank you for your service. But I know how important all of that is yeah. to them, right? Like that family time is, is what they yeah. need. It's, yeah. It's extremely valuable. Yeah. Because you go to the institutional assignment like this, and then you wrap that up, now you're deployed somewhere. Yeah. Now it's more time away from your family. So yeah. we want to maxim maximize that with the family and create a culture where we're taking care of the soldier first yeah. and uh, accomplish the mission. So I learned a valuable lesson about that. Yeah. Then the education experience I had through this RFP process, and this goes back to 
kind of old home week here, and yeah. things we saw transform, I brought all of these providers of learning technologies to the Army Recruiting School, companies like CyberU, that used to, <laughs> you know, get, became Cornerstone, Saba uh, Software, uh, Learn.com, Think yeah. Learning Solutions, okay, now Plateau. You, plateau, now you guys are really getting the in <laughs> behind the scenes because right. these were the biggest companies in SaaS at the time. That was before there was a, a real sales force. That was before there was, uh, even the big guys had ever thought about going cloud. These guys were going cloud earlier than anybody yeah, else exactly. at that point in time. They were, they were leaning forward and you talk about transformation, some yeah. of those were hybrid cloud, some of those were web-based platforms, other companies like Click to Learn. Um, long story short, we did the selection process, and a lot of the founders maybe listen to yeah. this, but it exposed me to the founders of these companies yeah. at an early stage. And I was enamored by the transformational power that they were kind of changing the market of using yeah. the internet, web-based platform to deliver training and content at the point of need. We selected a company called Click to Learn. Mm -hmm. The CEO yes. of Click to Learn was a guy named Kevin Oaks. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, he was the CEO that Paul Allen founded when he founded Click to Learn, which yeah. was previously called Asymmetric Learning. Yeah. So we selected Click to Learn, Aspen Learning Product, installed it. The return of ROI was massive. Yeah. We scaled that. We did, we did our whole content development curriculum to make it more blended learning. We were the first probably governmental organization that took advantage of of internet-based learning, and that's how I got exposed to all these founders and HR tech. Yeah, and, and then you went in to run many of some of those companies over time, and I think, you know, on, you know as you guys are sort of listening to this, I, I always love to hear that background story, like how did you get into this world, right? Yeah. And Jim, not only, I think, is it fascinating to sort of hear how you got there from sort <clears> of <throat> in history-making moments in, yeah. in your life, right? to the point at which you're sort of seeing the return on the investment of that HR technology. Yeah. And that's a lot, I think, from what I've heard you talk about with what you guys are doing at Zeroed In, you're bringing all of that with you. I think yeah. that was that was the most exciting thing. When you first reached out to me and said, hey, I'm doing something new, I was like, I was like let's talk, because not only did you understand <coughs> the, the return on investment, but you also understood it in a world that can be a little hard, which is yeah. government, yeah. local, federal, all of those areas, high compliance, yeah. high risk, yeah. right? People's yeah. lives are on the line. Yeah. And, and you're taking that now, and I think Zeroed In seems like you're, you're, you're going to sort of build into sort of a tool that maybe has a lot of value for that kind of yeah. compliance world. Talk a little bit about what you guys are trying to achieve at Zeroed yeah. In right now. I'm going to build up to that, yeah. because I think you made a good point about transformational moments, right? So yeah. I saw at the advent of that kind of SaaS adopt, yeah. right? And at that time, you and I were in the industry. I got out of the Army. I was going to go do some governmental work and politics for the governor of Florida. Yeah. And my wife goes, no, you've been in the Army 21 years, you're going to get a real job. Yeah, always so, listen to the wife on that one, Bryce. Exactly. So I, I did went to work for Click to Learn, and we bought a company called Doset, and we formed some total systems. Yeah. I, stayed, I stayed there. I saw the power that we could have impacted organizations. Yeah. To your point, I got getting a return investment on training, yes. L&D, and even some sort of onboarding. And then I went to work for Saba, another yeah. great founder, Bobby Isdani. Yeah. who was, you know, kind of moment in time, you know, Salesforce was just coming to to fruition there, yes. cloud-based CRM, right? It was huge. Um, technology on sales. Yep. And then there was this founder, named Adam Miller, <laughs> that besides Benioff, had the conviction that SaaS was going to kind of submit on-premise or hybrid software. Yeah. And click to, I mean, and CyberU rebranded itself as Cornerstone. Yeah. And all this time, going back to that pivotal moment at the RFP, I stayed in contact with people like that. So after the Saba exit, and we we had a conversation, and Adam goes, look, I think SaaS will become a pivotal transformation moment, just like the internet was, mm -hmm. and people will adopt cloud technologies at scale, even governmental organizations. That's all I don't know. I'm sure you and Mark are convicted about that, but me being a government guy, it's going to be a, a lagger indicator. So he calls me in like 2015. He was like, hey, Jim, we just closed our first software as a service deal at U.S. Department of Treasury. I was like, okay, that's a signal. That's <laughs> to your and point. Yes, you start to watch what's happening, right? You start to watch what's happening. You see transformation in industries. Yeah. So I went to work at Cornerstone, yeah. and Adam gave me the opportunity to kind of take, and I'll get to your question in yeah. a moment, take the conviction I had about solving complex customer problems, particularly around recruiting, learning, onboarding, compensation, retention with Cornerstone yeah. Talent Management integrated product, 
And we took that to state and local organizations, health organizations, and federal government. We invested in security like yeah. FedRAMP. We were first to market in FedRAMP yeah. in the federal government. And we provided extreme value to those verticals that delivered a cornerstone product to yeah. them. And that taught me another pivotal moment in transformation of how the industry is changing and how you drive ROI. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, you asked me the question, yeah. why I'm convicted about zero in. So how this circle works is the founder of Zero Den is a guy named Chris Moore who worked as a CPO and founder of a training server who sold to Think Learning Systems, which was bought by Sava. Yeah. So yeah, this circle. That all works. goes back around. It's it a very small around. world. It's a very small yeah. world. So I'd watched Chris build this analytics platform, mainly focus on learning analytics. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because at that time it was about learning effectiveness, Kilpatrick model, Jack, yeah. Jack Phillips ROI, oh, return man. on investment. I remember those and sessions. Jack, <laughs> um, and Kevin Oaks, you know, yeah. kind of now kind of kicking off uh, with a colleague of ours, Institute yeah. of Corporate Productivity. And I saw then that there was a need for robust data lakes, getting the data in one system. Yeah. And Chris was doing that, but mainly on learning. And my experience of Cornerstone taught me that, that you had this whole talent intelligence stack yeah. that you could really de develop a data lake where you can ingest all of these talent modules mm -hmm. in there and put the data in the right format and create the right taxonomy, then you had the ability to surface that data and provide powerful insights. So getting back to long story short, yeah. <laughs> I left Cornerstone in you know, 2023. Yep. Um, my last job there was the EVP of Americas. So at that time we went from public to private, we got bought by Clear Lake Capital. Mm -hmm. um, we did a couple of tuck in acquisitions under the leadership of uh, Phil Saunders and then uh, Hamanchu. Hamanchu, yep. Um, Just talked to him yesterday. Yep. You know, Ed Cass, yep. you know, Sava, mm -hmm. some total, talking about full circle, yes. where I started my career. I had the opportunity to be the general manager of some total yep. as my role, the EVP of Cornerstone. And then I had a great run there, and then the Opportunity Horizon Aperture kind of kicked in for me, my Gemini, so I like to do more than one thing at a time. Because <laughs> I really thought he was going to like, just do a little, not not full retirement, but semi-retirement, take it easy. That's what I heard when he said he was, he was taking the next step. And we did but then, talk about that. We did, yeah, yeah. and then then you yeah. called me and said, I got something else going yeah, on, yeah. right? So look, I, I had a great learning <laughs> yeah. curve. I, I took you know, I took an advisory role in a couple yeah. of AI startups, particularly in the defense sector, special yeah. operations command. How do you take real-time intelligence and building a decision intelligence platform? You know, a great company I worked for, Crete, where I was an advisor, along with General Stan McChrystal, yeah. who was the commander of Special Operations Command, and was all about doing knowledge graphs and AI agents to comb the web through Twitter, Telegraph, Facebook, social media applications. Yep. They kind of didn't back sector, where's the original narrative coming from? And what's the connection of vectors? Yeah. Which is a real, you know, in, you know, in, intrinsic social graph of where bad influences are coming from, right? Not to get it to yeah, it's, classification. It's a but, tough but market there, gave, yeah. What it gave me, Stacey, is a grown-up education on knowledge graph, vector databases, yeah. how AI works, meaningful AI, not just yeah. transformational AI of automating generative tasks, yeah. but how you can use the power of AI with knowledge graphs to go through thousands of networks of data. Yes. So, which is which is where the market I think needs to really get to because AI to to automate and do efficiency is great and I think that's a very important first step. But as you and I have discussed, AI n needs to help surface the things we aren't seeing, and that's what you were talking about. Okay. Right? No. So, I had a friend of mine who had yeah. partnered with Chris and came over yeah. and run to go to market. Who worked for me at Cornerstone, Lori Swain, and she's mm -hmm. like, you know, I think there's something here that if we can meaningfully expose data, surface those insights, create a common structure of you know, data truth, yep. and get data in the right format, then we could provide organizations those insights to make better decisions quicker, faster, yep. and more uh, in, in a more effective manner. I said, okay. So you know, I, I did an interview. I was pretty <laughs> com comfortable doing advisory work, and take a mini sabbatical, but what intrigued me was the market. There's always room for a different point of view. Yes. There's always room for a different diversity of thought of how you solve problems. Yeah. And I've been in this market like you for a long time, right? So 2002 to now is a long time. And it's I've seen time. all those pivotal transformations. I think we're yeah. another transformational moment. 
And that is solving the data issue is more than you, you're building a data lake, you ingest data, and you turn it over to customers, say, hey, Stacy, here's your tool, and you yeah. create dashboards, right? We've seen it, that with other We've people. seen it for a long time, and it doesn't really help the customers because they don't know what questions to ask. They don't know how to get that in the hands of people who need it. It's, it, it, it's a great first step sometimes, right? Great first step. Yeah. Kind of on a journey, a continuing yeah. journey of a long journey of analytical yeah. reasoning and decision making. So I fully uh, was convicted that there's room in the market for another voice and another yeah. point of view and another provider that at this point of transformation can really be pivotal in offering another application. Yeah to solve some business problems. I mean, we just did our session here at the HR Technology Conference where we were sharing all the data on analytic platforms and we're still seeing, even with the, the ones that we have now out in the market, that there's a lot of dissatisfaction with these applications. They're not right. quite getting it all the time, right? right? And I think everybody's trying, right? Like every vendor is yeah. doing as much as they can. But I but I like some of the conversation you have that, that not only talks about sort of like focusing a little bit on those areas where it really hits home, like compliance. Yeah. And and particularly in the industries that we've been talking yeah. about that you've got so much experience right. in. Because I know when, when we talk about compliance with big corporate entities, it's important. But when you talk about it with government, it's necessary. It's it it matters at a, at a at a very different level. Let me you know because I because I think part of, of what I've really been intrigued with our conversations about is that you you have this vision. You've seen where the market's at. You know that there's some openings to have something that's a little different that maybe thinks a little bit different. Zeroed in I think is building a a. a new approach to sort of the services and the technology conversation, right? But one of the things we hear over and over again is that customers are just, they're overwhelmed. They don't know where to start with this process. Right. And you've talked a lot about meeting the customers where they're at. Can you talk a little bit about how you think that you guys are going to be able to maybe connect those dots, particularly for maybe organizations who are still at the beginning of maybe a compliance-based need or moving into best practices or moving right. into a strategic HR right, function. Right. How, how, does, how does one system meet all those needs? Yeah, I, I love yeah. kind of the journey you laid out because yeah. I think that's, in my mind, conception last the journey we want to paint and have yeah. point of view on. So, first of all, to the competitors out there, you know, who I know very well, yeah. they're great friends of mine. I think competition is good, I think, Collaboration is good. Yeah. I think there's a spot for everybody in a niche of a market to solve certain problems. Yeah. I think what we want to be more, is more relative to your point. Yeah. So how do you how do you be more relative to your customer and your, you know, your ideal customer, yeah. or how do you map to those pain points they're trying to solve? So I have this point of view, and I'm trying to get my team rallied around this point of view, that you know people say we're going to meet the customer where they are. I think first you need to have a point of view on that journey. Yeah. And I think you articulate it very well, and if I get it wrong, you'll correct me. <laughs> but I think on the people analytics journey, it's a new journey for a lot of people. Yeah. Not to be an oxymoron there, but some people in some organizations are just trying to build the building blocks of taking 12 data pools or 12 investments they have in HR yeah. tech stack or operational data or other data sources and trying to get that data into a format that creates this single source of truth or a common operating framework. Yeah. They struggle with that. They don't have a lot of budget. They don't have data scientists. Yeah. They don't want to build a data scientist team. It's hard to go to a board or a deputy secretary of an organization yeah. in the federal government and say, hey, I want to invest $3 million and hire all these people. You hire all these people and you're, you're no better off because you can't get your data in a, in a format that you can report on. Constant right? issue, yeah. So that is kind of meeting customers where they're at. Mm -hmm. Understanding where they are on the journey from people, from resources, from maturity. Yeah. I think we're doing a lot of work of understanding that in certain customer profiles and in certain industries, that's yeah. one. Two is, there's certain customers in certain industries, and I think more industries pretty soon, if you think about the legislative agenda and what's going to come out of the federal government, right? yeah. labor data, reporting, pay equity, you see yeah. that in Europe already, in EMEA, yeah. it's, going to, it's going to come here pretty soon. So how can you kind of lean forward in that and say, okay, we can, kind of see where the puck's going. Yeah. We can say, okay, what can we do in our tool set and our services to kind of meet customers where they are on that yeah. and kind of get there and help them along. Yeah. Then once you're there, you kind of install the system and you help them kind of get on that journey and maybe it's basic essentials yeah. of reporting. Maybe it's dashboards from the line of businesses or maybe it's for non-governmental organizations. It's, hey, my CEO wants this report on this type of use cases yeah. present to the board, then make better decisions on investments. That's one. Yeah. Then we move 
to the right of that data uh, or that journey model to what you're talking mm -hmm. about best in class. She got customers that I've sold to, mm -hmm. that other vendors have sold to, you know, applicant tracking systems, onboarding system, learning <laughs> system, systems, content, yeah. performance management, you know, you know, pay systems, yeah. you know, how do you get all that data and then best practices report on the effectiveness or the efficiency of those systems and yeah. what are you getting for the ROI? And that's a really hard thing because most of the best practices is built around companies that don't always look like us. And so it's a great starting point, but to get the ROI, I've got to really know more about my business, right? Right. Yeah. So that leads to the strategic outcomes. Yeah. And I'll go back to you know, relevance. Yeah. I believe and am convicted there are certain industries that want, want you to meet them more than where they are. Yeah. They want your point of view, they want data that's rolling through their industry, they want best practice and use cases, mm -hmm. and they want benchmark data. Yeah. If I'm a healthcare organization and I am XY, how am I doing against ABC company, mm -hmm. right? We're recruiting acute care, post acute yeah. care. How am I then pulling operational data? How am I serving my clients? How am I meeting, you know, you know, my healthcare clients at the point of need, clinician, yeah. you know, point of need care, right? Perfect use case. How do I hire the right talent at certain, you know, hospitals or certain regions, mm -hmm. right? So that's one example. And Government. you're, you guys are actually bringing the services side of that to help them figure that out. That's so when they, when right. they come into the system, they're not just going to a blank slate. They're coming with a conversation about what are you trying to right. achieve, so right? So what we're going to invest in is the benchmarking data, right? Yeah. So, you know, we got, we've got customers that we pulled in CMS data, HHS yeah. data, right? So you can start benchmarking and profiling what best in class looks like, mm -hmm. right? Go to another use case. Maybe it's labor data. Mm -hmm. When you talk about payroll, yeah. right? How do you how do you do that? How what does pay equity data look like in healthcare versus state and local government versus you know banking and finance versus other verticals, right? And then you get to federal government and state government is you know it's compliance driven, but it's constituent facing. So you're dealing with taxpayer dollars. So how do you skill your workforce? I think a big use case that we're going to penetrate in the in the federal government, and we'll talk about our investment yeah. there a little bit later is how do you overcome what we've known was coming for a long time with the changes in demographic and age yeah. of the federal retiring workforce? How do you recruit more people to serve in the federal government? How do you then map competencies and skills, you know, skills taxonomy to serve in a department of labor versus VA versus mm -hmm. Department of Defense versus, you know, Intel agency? And to get into that, you guys have to do the FedRAMP work, right? Yeah. So FedRAMP is managed by the General Service Administration. Yeah. We go back to those transformational pivots in you know, 2012, 13, yeah. when government was adopting kind of a risk mitigation framework, say, mm -hmm. okay, if you're going to deploy cloud in a government organization, we've got to have some sort of building blocks to say what type of access and controls you have on the internet, internet yeah. protocols, a framework for risk management. And it's a pretty lengthy process with about 800 or to 1,000 security level yeah. controls. So you deploy in a Fed brand environment, you know, we most know most of those, it's AWS, it's yeah. Azure, you know, it's IBM Cloud, yeah. you know, those type of things. At Cornerstone gave me yeah. a perfect learning experience on how to do that, first yeah. in market. We think that you know, we we think the investment in FedRAMP to elevate our security is going to be paramount in serving those customers. So yeah. we we're almost finished with a major investment in SOC 2, which is a building yeah. block to FedRAMP and the, those yeah. controls. We, we'll be finished with that in a couple of months. We've hired an assessment organization yeah. uh, that is doing our SOC 2 work that will then begin the assessment of our environment in AWS that will say, here's your gaps around FedRAMP readiness. We complete that, that'll take a couple, a few months and we'll be in progress. We submit that documentation to GSA. At the same time, we're having a lot of conversation with federal customers, Yeah. potential customers. Well, it takes we a while to get to the federal conversation. Yeah. And and just to our audience for note, that the, the process he just walked through, very few people know about that. And it's, it's really good to understand it and to be able to ask your vendors about it, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. So, you know, we're, we're elevating that process, we've got, two substantial customers in the Intel, Intel community. Yeah. I can't go in you know, who those are, yeah. but we, it's a building block for us to branch out. Yeah. And we think we can serve, to answer your question, regulated industries, healthcare, you know, banking, credit unions, yeah. state and local government, federal government, and meet those customers yeah. where they are, relative data, understanding their business very deeply and solving those pain points around data analytics. 
Well, Jim, I'm excited about all that. I mean, not only is it nice to see someone who's excited about this conversation, right? But it's also exciting to sort of get a chance to hear about the plans you guys are putting in place and how you're sort of building up on something that has been, I think, a need in the market for a while. So as we know, we hear a lot of feedback on what people are looking for in their analytics platforms and, and what they need from a federal perspective or from a state and local, but also from a compliance and a business perspective. As we, and we've just got the sort of two minute sign for interview today, but maybe we could just do a, a last question where we kind of wrap up and say, we, I know you're launching the new sort of design for the platform and it's really focused on, on delivering sort of a, an, an intelligent approach, right? A, a design intelligence to help people or decision intelligence I think yeah, is the actual term, right? So the decision intelligence, I think, is is an interesting way to sort of put this idea that you're you're sort of rolling it together, but you're going to give them a more insight into yeah, the yeah. business outcomes. Yeah, yeah. yeah t- totally. So yeah. what we've been working on, you hear AI everywhere, yeah. right? We're, we're putting AI in practice. We've built machine learning AI to our data grass for years now. So what we want to do is surface those now with a kind of conversational layer. Yeah. And what we do is when you get the data sets in there, what you're essentially doing for a customer is inside the boundaries of an environment, yep. for us, extremely important, yep. you're using the customer data and benchmarking data to build large language models based on the customer data, not yep. outside the vector. Which is important. So, which is important. So what you can do then is the machine will start learning and was uncovering the section of HR, people analytics data with operational data, mm-hmm. right? Then what you get is surfable insights to say, you need to take action on these things and in in zero in will alert you say, mm-hmm. you've got a problem in this branch or this division around retention, take action, here's a recommended action to do. Yeah. We call that smarter intelligence, faster you know, yeah. insights to faster and smarter decisions. Which we're all looking for right now in this right. day. It's it's a huge gap, I think, and HR leaders are, are particularly focused on this conversation. Uh, audience, um, we really hope that this has been sort of a valuable sort of insight into what's going on, both, I think, from the perspective of HR analytics, but also from the bigger picture of how we bring some of these historical conversations we've been having into a more realistic work for the, the HR professionals who are doing it every day. Yeah. Jim, just as we're, we're signing off here today, if anybody wants to talk to you or wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to, to reach you and, and uh, have a conversation? I think the best way to reach me is I'm on social media, LinkedIn. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of go through that on a daily basis in my feed. You can go to our website, zeroin.com. And you can meet us at our booth here, 4622, if you're on site. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to having a conversation. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Jim. It was really a pleasure getting a chance to, Thank you. to talk to you again and hearing about all the stuff. Audience, we are, uh, we'll be back for our next session in just a few uh, days because we're going to be launching a lot of these this week. Thanks, everyone. Bye.